You're listening to UnitedWeStrike.com Radio. Don't buy, don't comply. Ask why. UnitedWeStrike.com Radio. Yeah, here we are again. This is Zetlov Wake News Radio and ICR Radio Networks and uh, UW, UWS uh, Radio. So we will have um, further discussion on the issues on the British riots. And I think uh, Brian Garish, um, he wanted to uh, talk to you, to us uh, about uh, the money system. And why don't you go ahead, Brian? Uh, um, okay. Take thank, it over. Thank you very much for that. Um, w w yes, the reason I wanted to come in on money is because... At the end of the day, if we look at the situation in Britain, and, and I know it's the same in other European countries, but as Albert has said, we've, we've had our manufacturing indus, uh, base, our manufacturing industry stripped away. So we've got many, many young people, hundreds of thousands, millions of young people who've got no skills. They've got no hope of getting a proper job. They can never afford to live properly or own their own homes or else they can only just get by on a week-by-week -week basis to feed themselves. And if we look at how this situation has arisen, we've got to come to the banks. And we now know there's no ifs or buts, there's no doubts. We now understand that we as a nation are in debt, supposedly, of uh, billions of pounds, trillions in fact, to international private banks and when we start to look in detail at, at how we're in debt we find that these international banking cartels have simply created the money which they've then loaned to national governments they create the money out of nothing but we have to work for it to repay it and now we're in this absolutely extraordinary situation where private banks are saying that we, the British nation, owe them trillions of pounds and the, the interest on that debt is destroying each and every one of us. I believe the figure is that each of us in Britain supposedly owes the international bankers £63,000. And if we go to Germany, we find the same situation if we go into France. So... It is an absolute lie for David Cameron and George Osborne, um, who's looking after our money supply. It is an absolute lie for those two men to say that we are, um, we've got to have these austerity measures. We've got to cut our schools and hospitals and defense in order to pay back this debt because the debt is fictitious money created by private international banks. And of course, if we said overnight, we are not repaying this fictitious debt, and I've got to bring up Iceland, what a brave country. Little Iceland mm -hmm. has said to the whole of the international banking community, no, we are not going to repay this debt. It is fraudulent. If we, the British nation, did this, overnight we would have the money to start to get our country and economy rebuilt and uh, ultimately... Iceland is actually thriving, um, yes, am I right yes. in saying that, Brian? Absolutely. But if I, because if they I just sacked finish, all their politicians, they put the bankers in jail and they've sorted just, their finances out there and they're on the up, as, as we say. But what is, can I ask Albert, what is the history of all of this? Because oh, Albert and well, I were on the show the other night. I was going to ask... Yeah, well, well, Alan, Alan, the the answer is quite simple. As far as England is concerned, um, we had no national debt when William the Third, William of Orange, came to the throne. Uh, but when he came to the throne, he wanted to borrow some money. He, he was having a little war on the continent. The uh, the Dutch were fighting the French, and I think the Portuguese, and were not doing too well. Um, part of his reason for taking the English throne was he wanted our army and our navy, but obviously they have to be paid for. Um, so he, he didn't have the money to do it, so he, he, he allowed some um, people who were uh, in the money lending business, uh, people like the Rothschilds, to open the Bank of England. And he then borrowed money from them 
uh, at exorbitant interest rates. I think they were charging between 25 and 36 percent interest. Um, so he borrowed this money in order that he could do what he wanted. Um, but the, the bank itself simply printed paper money. They didn't actually have the gold or silver bullion reserves to actually cover the amount of money they were printing on paper. So if everybody had gone to the Bank of England with a, a £5 note uh, that they'd issued and said, we want our £5 back, then the Bank of England would have collapsed there and then because there simply was no money available other than the money they'd printed to actually mm. cover the, the debt. So that's where it comes from, and this is where the fraud comes in, really. It, it, in it the, is. It's just one huge, it, it, giant fraud, and yeah, it's but, now amounted to what really what yeah. really amounts to austerity fascism. I mean, well, that's the only well, thing. And, and we are not the only nation, but, of course, we're here tonight to talk about England as a sovereign nation here um, but it is it's austerity fascism the people are having to pay the price f to bail out yeah, well, the banks the, the two big to fail yeah. banks banks I think there's yeah. a new world order term for this isn't there isn't it called increment on excrement if you know what I mean so anyone <laughs> the interest there on, the interest yeah can you hear that yeah, that, was, that was a good comment right <laughs> that's amazing increment on excrement yeah and problem, reaction, solution, that's what they want. You know, they create a problem, the people react to it in, a, in, a, in, a, in whatever way they are in, and then they have the solution, that's a new world order. That's strange enough, isn't it? Uh, are we seeing, with these riots, uh, the way they started, um, an example of the new world order at work then? Is this a, a movement towards police state control? Well, you think in, in we have evidence of that emerging now on, on, with these riots in the United Kingdom? Sorry, Tony, did you say, do we have evidence? Just by these riots alone uh, and what we've witnessed in the Commons today. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We, we've had trouble caused. And um, one, one of the things I've got interested in is that a lot of people out there um, speak quite, uh, they're quite hard. They're quite tough on our police. Um, but the police have basically been pushed from pillar to post. One minute they're supposed to be soft, the next minute they're supposed to be hard. Uh, they're to crack down on crime, and then we see policemen being made redundant. So the police are messed around. And um, if you look at what has come out of this, the trouble on the streets, it is a massive clampdown by the government. And to hear Cameron talking... Um, uh, he said something on the news last night, I won't remember it exactly, but he said there are broken families and then there are people who are absolutely criminal. And the moment he said it, I thought to myself, yes, Mr. Cameron, and the people who are most criminal reside in 10 Downing Street. Mm, but yeah, there's no yeah. question in my mind that the trouble, um, some of it may have arisen spontaneously, but I believe it's been stirred up. And the aim of it was to get a public reaction which said, bring in tighter police measures. And um, those are now coming in. So we're talking about curfews. And I, I am sure that we're going to see more trouble on the streets so that the government can bring in even greater police powers. And can I'm going to mention Brian, this. Yeah, Brian, yeah. he used the term, Cameron used the term uh, sick society, quote, unquote. Yes. Sick society so they're blaming it on the quote sick society but my question is what other noises are the government making you were identifying a few of them there brian the other <laughs> target for the government uh, or the new world order s supra government the over government shadow government or what have you the control system um they're also targeting people using uh social what they call social media and that is blackberry phones and you know uh, uh, internet access and so on so what what are they going for? What do you think, Tony? Can I can I can I come in here? Um, Go ahead, Albert. Ba basically, I mean, you've got Mr. Cameron, haven't you? And you've got Boris Johnson in London, the Mayor of London. I've, I've rabbited on about the the criminality here. Uh, both of these people at university had more money than sense, and and would quite frequently go into a restaurant, uh, get drunk, and then smash it up. But because they could afford to pay for the damages, they were never, ever charged with their criminality. 
So we've got a group of, uh, of overgrown criminals who are now looking down on some other criminals who don't have the money to get themselves out of trouble. And what is Mr. Cameron's answer to this? Mr. Cameron's answer to this is, well, we'll stop their social security money and we'll have them thrown out of their council houses. So it's what's that going to do? Yeah, what it's is absurd, that going to do? isn't it? That is going to put, that is going to put, if we look at the numbers of people on the streets around the country that were setting fire to things and burgling and, and doing this rioting, that is going to put thousands of young people who have no hope, even with their dole money and their council houses, they have no hope of doing anything. That is going to put that lot onto the street. That is immediately going to put the crime rate up through the roof. Mm. It's, it's already absurd. high enough. It's already high enough. Whatever the police tell you about statistics or government tell you about police statistics, um, the reason the police statistics are showing a fall in crime is because if you go to the police station to report a crime, the first thing they tell you is you don't report crime here. You have to phone this number. When you phone that number, they tell you they're not going to give you a crime book number because they're not recording it as a crime, but as a crime-related incident. So it's not recorded as a crime. That's why the crime figures are going down. It's got nothing to do with actual crime falling. That isn't. That's going up. But the amount of crime recorded is going down. That makes the government look good. Um, it makes the police force look good. But in fact, it does absolutely nothing for society generally. And now if they throw all these people out their council houses and stop all their dole money, they're going to have nowhere to live and no money to buy food or clothing with. They are simply going to steal it. And if they can steal it, as we've seen pictures of them forcing people to undress in the street so they can steal their clothes they're wearing off of their backs, then it won't be mm. very long before they simply start murdering people to get money well, and everything. I, I absolutely agree. It is the most ridiculous uh, policy suggestion, isn't it? Well, what's your assessment, Tony? Are you there? Yes, certainly. One, one of the most worrying things I, I've heard uh, in the debates in the Commons was the possible use of the military and under what circumstances the military might be bought in um, as, the, as and when these riots uh, crop up, as I'm sure they will. But there aren't any, and, Tony. They're all abroad fighting these uh, fake wars uh, overseas. So, But I want to tell you a little anecdote of a, of a gentleman that... Um, rang me yesterday he was on a train spe speaking to uh, quite a level-headed and intelligent squaddy and that squaddy um, who was at uh, a lance corporal level had received training in many skills and they called it the pathfinders and he'd been to Afghanistan and Iraq uh, and that they'd been receiving tra training um, at a serious political education level which included theory about martial law um, and everything was seemed to be superseded in favour of absolute allegiance to the monarch and, de de and actually dealing with civil unrest and they would have been taught and indoctrinated that it was the army's job to push the armed police towards the rioters and to shoot them, meaning the police if they retreat or run away so if the police aren't going to enforce things and the military are behind them, the military will turn on the police. Um, now, that's just one anecdote, and you, take, you make of that what you will. But clearly, I've, the message I got from hearing from the debate in the Commons was that they are contemplating the military, and although nobody is calling it yet, apart from the only one, I, the, one of the politicians I've heard is Nick Farage, uh, he's been calling for the military, but there are sound bites, and it's almost a preparation for the military to come in. Whatever context that military takes, whether it's the United Nations or, or our own military, um, you know, that is potentially a threatening development. Well, uh, Tony, uh, just, just a hint here from... Um uh, step back a little from from the mic because your voice is so angry. <laughs> you can hear this all over the world, you know, internationally. Uh, can I ask Brian? Br Brian, um, can I ask a very simple question? That if they use uh, proposing to use military, where are they going to get the military uh, resources and the you know the, the the manpower, as it were? Because all these chaps are abroad fighting these wars, and they're not here in England to defend their own country. Are they going to use foreign troops? I mean, what? Uh... In in my opinion, right. this is 
in my opinion, this is absolutely what, what they're trying to do at the moment. They are keeping British troops overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan, involved in wars which are clearly unlawful and resulting in, in deaths and thousands of injuries that are not being reported. And, and uh, aside from the uh, injuries to our own troops, uh, we know, of course, that uh, that uh, m many, many injuries and deaths are occurring in the civilian populations. But the aim is to keep British troops out of the country so that when trouble can be stirred up on an even greater scale by the government, the government can then say, oh, we need help. We need help for our police. And my prediction is that we will see the government start to call for European police, Euro Gen 4, to come into Britain to help keep order, and that if the situation is allowed to escalate further, we will see them calling for European military to come in on the streets. And uh, it is becoming so clear now that we are watching our military, particularly the army, being dismantled day by mm. day by day and aside from people losing their jobs in the army we know that one of the things that's happening is that there are more and more proposals that those um, unemployed soldiers are being encouraged to get involved with private security companies and this is a very very wor worrying um, situation where it looks, it even looks as if the government is prepared to use private security companies to try and help the police. This is very dangerous. This it, is all this is. It's it's very you know all this is, is it's really it's very it sounds very criminal to me, frankly. And is it sounds treasonous? Is it treasonous? Uh, is it treason, um, Albert? Please. Well, I mean, yeah. The, the short answer is yes. It is treason. Um, the, the the good thing is that being a policeman, I I, I still talk to policemen, uh, and the general consensus is that if the if the Euro Gendarmerie were brought in, then our police would um, actually probably end up arresting them uh, because you know they don't want them here, and it's their job, not Euro Gendarmerie's job, to actually keep law. I, I think the problem is we all know what the problem is, we all know where it stems from, but what we have to do is deal with that problem. And I, I think that every country in, in the world could deal with this. Uh, and what they have to do is they have to do what we're trying to do over here, what I'm trying to do, which is to actually reinstate the English Constitution. Because the English Constitution makes absolutely everything that's going on a treasonable offence of high treason. Um, and, of course, we can hang you for that. Um, so Tony, Tony Blair actually repealed the death penalty for treason um, but because that makes treason more likely to occur um, and places the sovereign and constitution at grave risk, that in itself was treasonable and therefore doesn't count. But, I mean, basically what I would advise people to do is, wherever you are in the world, have a look at your own country's constitution, compare that, what it says, to what is going on in your country, and then insist, as we are doing over here, um, in fact, I've just drafted a letter this evening for somebody to a for, to a policeman, um, because what we're doing over here is we are reporting um, people for treason to the police. Um, now the police are, are dragging their heels a bit, but nevertheless, uh, we're getting more and more people reporting it, and the police are taking it more and more s seriously. Whereas before they were simply laughing your face, now they are actually going away and. Uh, I've just re uh, answered a letter tonight to a, pro to a policeman who'd actually taken advice from his forces legal people on whether treason had actually occurred or not. Um, I've now written back to him to explain to him why his legal people are wrong and that he has an absolute duty in law to not only accept the allegation of treason but actually to investigate it and to study the treason laws so that he can compare the two together and if he does that, there's no doubt he should, if he's a good policeman, go out and start arresting people left, right and centre. Um, so we have to actually ha have a campaign plan to actually fight back 
too often we go to meetings and people stand up and tell us what's wrong in the world. Well, we generally speaking knew that before we got out of bed in the morning. What people don't know is what they do about it. And that mm. I see as our job, as, as people who've studied this, like Brian doing mm. the, the common purpose and his, his particular thing, which is extraordinarily valuable, certainly yes. within the United Kingdom and, and probably throughout the rest of the civilized world. Common purpose is a real threat to everybody. So what Brian is doing is extraordinarily valuable work. But what we have to do is, is, is have a plan of campaign as to how we actually fight back. There's no good simply saying, yeah, okay, we know what's wrong, but oh dear, what do we do? We can tell them what to do. And, yes, if, enough people do, and if enough people do it, we will mm. reverse this pl process. Mm. Well, can I ask uh, Albert, can I ask you, and also I'd like to ask uh, Brian the same, and Tony as well, of course, about the morale what what is your assessment about the morale situation as far as the uh, the British police force? Um, you know, national oh, the, police the, 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 I, I, my, my my honest opinion is that the British police force's morale is actually shot to pieces. Um, firstly, they you know it, it's it's traditional for English policemen to walk down the street and say hello to everybody that they meet and have a nice little friendly chat. Mm. Now, if a policeman says anything to anybody, if he walks down the beach, he's sees his local butcher and turns around and said, oh, morning, Harry, how are you? He's got to write that on a piece of paper uh, and put a report in about the fact that he said good morning to the local butcher. It is ludicrous. Um, mm. So he doesn't, because he doesn't want to fill in the paper, he doesn't say anything to the butcher anymore. Butcher thinks he's miserable. He knows the butcher thinks he's miserable. Um, mm. And, of course, <laughs> that has a knock-on effect on his morale. There is far too much paperwork in the police force. Mm. If you and, and that is if you also arrest of somebody for put in there. If, it's, yeah, but if if you arrest somebody for a comparatively minor shoplifting offence, you're looking at about six hours worth of paperwork. Yeah, so what's happening with the policeman is being yeah, handicapped because of the paperwork. He, he's not yeah. doing. He's, yeah, no, no, but that's but, intentional, but, isn't it? That's what they've put yeah, that but in. The, the point, point, point that I'm making, Alan. Point I'm making is you've got all this paperwork to do, but the only piece you can use in court is your original note. The rest of it, you could, you could photocopy your original note, give it to a typist, and she could fill in all the rest of the forms with her computer. Uh, you could even set the computer, just feed the information, and it would just print all the forms off instantly. And then all you have to do is autograph them all at the end of the day. So the police so officers are buried alive under... It? Yeah, but they're buried alive under, under paperwork... They're buried alive under restriction. They are having to learn um, new law all the time because every time the European Union imposes a new European law on us, which is highly illegal and an act of high treason for us to take it, but every time they do, they run a class for every policeman in the country to learn it. And because mm. the European Union is punching law out faster than you can you know, do, do, do whatever. An you know. yeah. then, then, then in point of fact, our police officers are spending an inordinate amount of time in classrooms being taught about it when they do not need any of this extra legislation. The original English law is all they need. And I'm sure that the French police would say the same. The original French law is all they need, as would the German police. So, mm. so basically, what you're doing is you're destroying the morale by... by, by there's nothing more soul-destroying than sitting at a desk filling in forms all bloody day long. And that's mm. what the police are having to do. And, and, that, so, and it's, so just, I think it's kind of systematic sort of thing, yeah, isn't I, it? I think police morale is suffering. Mm. I think but, I mean, a, on a, what, and that brings us into the realms, Brian, of, um, of the whole ju judiciary system. And, and, and you, know, uh, you know, bluntly, what about all these bent judges, allegedly? Uh, and, and all of that kind of thing that you're, you're quite uh, experienced with. Well, I'd, I'd just say that, that I've only dealt with, with evidence in this subject. I've been in court now numerous occasions. Um, how many? I'm not quite sure, but I'm going to say it's about 12 uh, times. Initially, you go in with an open mind. You hear what people say, and, and the cases that I've been attending are to do with children being taken away from their parents by the state. But eventually, I'm in... I'm involved with cases where 
I am looking at documentation and statements that have been falsified. I'm looking at um, psychiatric opinion being given on a mother, which makes the mother out to be mad. And you know that the psychiatric opinion is completely false. I have been in court where the judge has allowed the local authority to, to present witnesses against the mother, but refused the mother to present her own defence witnesses, even though they were elected members of her local authority. And in one case, those um, councillors were prepared to swear on oath that at the time the mother's child was taken away, their own counsel was breaking the law. And the judge simply refused to allow the mother to have those witnesses in court. More recently in uh, Portsmouth, a judge called Hetherington, we watched from the public gallery as he effectively directed a jury to find a mother guilty. Um, when you go in and you see this, and, and you, you see the evidence, you handle the documentary evidence yourselves, for yourself, you suddenly realise that, well, for me, there is no justice in the United Kingdom at the moment. We have unbelievable corruption in our courts. And I, I will say a young Polish man said to me the other day, and, and this comment made me laugh, but I was also very sad. He said to me, Brian, you've just woken up to the fact that your courts are corrupt. In Poland, from the moment we're born, we understand our courts are corrupt. So I'm going to admit to the audience tonight that I was incredibly naive about part of the British system. But I have absolutely no doubt now that we are seeing massive corruption and political control in our courts. And one of the effects of that is that when good people, some of them are police officers, some of them may be professional people, some of them like Albert are members of the general public, when those people have stepped forward with the evidence that our own government is, is committing treason, it is these corrupt judges who are closing down the courts to actually close down the case against the government and in some cases to actually suppress and destroy evidence. So I'm sad to say it, but at the moment in UK, we're in a very, very dangerous and difficult position. Mm. But I would like to say one thing on the morale of the police, and I know Albert is correct in saying it's really rock bottom, but over the last four months, maybe only three months, we are starting to get more and more contact from police officers who want to know more about what we are talking about. So when we are saying we are being attacked by our own government, they want to know more about this. And we've got police officers now who are starting to come forward to report corruption in the police. And this is a very, very important factor because if we say to ourselves, sorry, if we say to ourselves, who is going to clear up the corruption in the police, then the answer is the police themselves are going to do it. Yeah, um, maybe, maybe I step in here just, just for a sec. Um, we are listening here to a special broadcast uh, on ICR radio networks or UWS and Wake News Radio. Um, and we are listening to um, several very well-known people who are discussing the rioting in the UK. So just uh, for all our international listeners who just turned in, you know, uh, tuned in uh, so uh, they know. And uh, let me just uh, ask one more thing um, to Brian. Uh, Brian, isn't it um, that uh, Mr. Cameron is actually a Rothschild uh, sort of uh, child or, you know, uh, uh, somebody who works for the Rothschilds, who meets them regularly. And, uh, and uh, you know, you were talking about the money system as well. And he was just spending his uh, holidays in, in Italy. So maybe he visited uh, the um, Eurogent Force, uh, which is located in northern Italy. So there are several uh, coincidences with, which we uh, talked about on the Swiss uh, uh, radio transmission today. What would you say? 
Uh, well, I, I can't um, at the moment state that I've got the evidence that uh, Cameron is a Rothschild. Maybe people can correct me on that. But not, what not, I, he's not, married not, not, to one, perhaps. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Some, something like that, or that he has a connection. certain connection to him. Well, no, he doesn't don't have to even name names, though. I mean, all of these politicians, of course, are puppets uh, on the strings of these, uh, you know, absolutely unimaginably wealthy and powerful banksters, somebody, some people call them, <laughs> you know. But I, I wanted Brian to finish with the, the morale and, and go for, also go just a little bit about the... Um, th about the Royal Navy and the services, the military, and so on. H what's your assessment, your evaluation of that, please, Brian? Well, and Alan, and if, to Alan something else. If, if I may, I'll just just finish that point on Cameron. Um, mm. I'm being I'm being precise here because I know that when when people listen to these shows and and people are talking, they they want to know that people are being accurate. And, and I'm being truthful. I, I can't prove to the audience that, that uh, Cameron is a Rothschild. What I can say is without any doubt, every single one of our prime ministers, whether it's been Tony Blair or Gordon Brown or Cameron, are absolutely intertwined with people at very high level in the banking system. It's, it is, it's absolutely obvious that we don't have politicians who are running the country. We have politicians who are told what to do by the people with the power, and those people are the international bankers. Um, as one example, we know for a fact that the Bank of England is absolutely not a, a bank for the British nation. It is a bank which is dealing with private clients, We know that the Bank of England will not reveal who those clients are. We know that our own politicians are not allowed to ask penetrating questions about the Bank of England on the floor of the House of Commons. What an extraordinary question. Our own elected um, MPs cannot ask questions about our bank. We know that Gordon Brown without any debate, sold off the whole of Britain's gold reserves. And we also know that since he did that, that the Rothschild empire has done nothing but buy gold. So that's, that's I hope, an answer to the first point. With regard to morale in the armed services, we yeah. know at the moment that, as with the police, morale is plummeting in the armed services, You have people who are expected to go overseas and fight and die, mm. supposedly, for their country in Afghanistan. Um, soldiers coming back from Afghanistan, the ones we have spoken to, it's quite amazing how much they now know. Those soldiers are coming back from Afghanistan and they know that part of their role is not to destroy poppy crops because they're not allowed to do this. They, they understand that they're inherently protecting poppy crops and the, the huge profits from drugs which are going into the international banks. So on one hand, morale is bad, but if you, if you want a positive point, I think it's the speed at which our military are waking up to what's happening around them. Mm. Can yeah? Can Crikey, I just come we are, in? We are in a pickle, aren't we, chaps? Yeah, Alan, Alan. Can I just come in quickly? Um, yes. Brian and Brian and I both know a lady who's an excellent researcher. I'm not going to give her a name because she doesn't want me to. But um, she is a first class researcher. She's just given me a report uh, that she has drawn up, and she's going to send some out anyway. Um, but she's not attributing it to her because she doesn't want the fallback, the comeback. But I don't mind. I'll attribute it if you like. They can attribute it to me. I don't care. Um, in it, uh, I mean, she points out, as, as Cameron himself did, that he is proud of his Ashkenazi roots. Now, the Ashkenazi are all these top bankers that are actually uh, running the world, the Rothschilds and all the others of them. They're all Ashkenazi Jews. It's not being anti-Semitic. That's a statement of fact. Um, Where did they and, originate from, um, and, Albert, these people? Well, they, they originated from a country uh, between a Muslim country and a Christian country. Um, I think it's Kazakhstan. And what happened was that they were being attacked by the Muslims on the one side, the Christians on the other. 
and the, the ruler of the country decided that if they said they were Jewish, they wouldn't be attacked because people would want to borrow money off them. So, so they, 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 the king ordered the entire nation to become Jewish, um, and they then moved out of their country onto the steppes of Russia because that's where the money was. Um, and then from there on in, they've gone around the world. Now, if you want to find a real proper live Jew, um, then you look in a tailor's shop in Staple Row or an East End uh, shop where they're manufacturing furniture in England. Um, if you want to find an Ashkenazi Jew, they're all in the banks. So, um, but basically what she's done is she's, she's actually pointed out that um, Cameron's actually said he's proud of, Ash, uh, of his Ashkenazi roots, um, which probably means that's where his money comes from. And also that Nick Clegg is also an Ashkenazi, um, and oh. and and so so basically we now have the two top politicians in the country are both members of a class of people who are planning one world government uh, and who want to reduce the world's population from the um, nine billion or trillion or whatever it is at the moment really down to five enough. down to five hundred thousand. Uh, which means million. that hit, hit, if they're going to do that in a hurry, that means that Hitler is going to look like a bungling amateur with his concentration camps. Um, so, so basically, so these massive are massive depopulation, nice. isn't yeah, it? Yeah, they, they are. They are not nice people. They are. They are very selfish people. They marry first cousins, which uh, you're not really allowed to do that in England, but they do. They marry their first cousins to keep the money in the family. And, and basically, these are the people that are trying to take over the world, and these are people we have to deal with. Um, I'm agreeing with Brian. I think that the, 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 uh, when, when we get our country back, I think we say to the bankers, well, stuff the money. We say we owe you. We don't. You've had it back several times over. Like not the Icelanders, only, not, not only that, Not only that, but we are nationalizing every single bank that you've got. Uh, that's within our borders, and uh, you know we're not giving you nothing for it because you've you've taken the. Um, I was going to say something, but you've taken the Michael something something chronic over the years, um, and all that's coming to an end. Um, so I think that basically what we have here is is a smallish group of people, probably I would think worldwide, about six or seven thousand. I don't know if you'd agree with that, Brian who are actually trying to get world domination. Uh, and they're trying to get it through banking, through money. If you lend money to a government, uh, and the government can't pay that money back to you when you demand it, then government are more likely to do whatever you tell them to do in order to avoid paying it back and having themselves declared bankrupt. So, you know, mm. I mean, I think so that's the situation. Just, de debt slavery, isn't it? Debt slavery, really. But now they've extended it to national sovereign countries. Yeah, and, um, and this, so, and this so, is so, why. Like, look at the beast now. Um, what's, what's your view about uh, what Albert's, you know, I mean, Albert's been saying about this new world order system, uh, which, uh, uh, to quote Brian, um, has surfaced and now everybody can look at it and actually see this beast. Um, and wake up to it, as it were. Are you asking me, Alan? Did you, I, I was going to say, Tony, would you would you like to to join in because you, you've yes. got a you've got a phenomenal story that you've um, I'm going to say gently you've you've come out of nowhere almost, and then you've really challenged the system by saying that that what you've been taught and told to believe you you've absolutely looked at and and it's not true why don't why don't you tell us a bit about how you've started to look at the world from a different uh, perspective well yes, uh, it's fascinating yeah i mean i obviously uh, as a principal intelligence analyst looked at uh, you know the strategic threat and the government narrative and and, and any source information I had within the police service but it was a completely different story to the one was available from open source information that was largely, in my opinion, hidden from the many principal intelligence analysts that uh, are in England and Wales. And so it came as a, a shock to the system when I first alerted to my management team in a gentle way, in a perfectly controlled way, uh, to the notion of a new world order being a potential threat. 
Um, but it wasn't welcome news, and um, the, the attitude of South Yorkshire Police seemingly was to shoot the messenger. Um, I offered to give insight, and I offered to keep it under their control. Um, I didn't go shouting off. I, I've been very quiet for a year since dismissal, and it was only out of necessity that I've gone public uh, with my own employment tribunal. But the interesting thing about the police and their reaction to that was they said a few things um, that are philosophical. They said, Tony, we are just the government foot soldiers. Tony, we're not here to rock the boat. Um, actually, Tony, you may well be correct in your beliefs, but it's not where we are today. So there's, there's some, I would call it, is it cowardice in the leadership of the police that are not prepared yet to stand up and, and put the head above the parapet? Where are the chief constables speaking out? Where it, do, we, do we have any clear leadership from any of the chief constables? Because when we talk about the morale in the police, the police will look up to their leadership. And at the moment, we've got the leadership force being the Metropolitan Police that's in total disarray and is actually responsible for many of the flashpoints that we can look back on uh, that have caused this discontent and disquiet amongst the police service. Um, but we've got nodding donkeys, chief constables and ACPO that seem to be silent on the matter instead of being vocal. And that concerns me. And um, when they see fit to dismiss a principal and an intelligence analyst for trying to alert them to the terrible truth that's out here, uh, and rather than call for more insight, they simply try to brush it aside, then I think we've got problems with the leadership within the police. And, and I think that corrodes the morale. Um, people want to look up to their managers for ethical decision making. And I think time and time again, um, when we see police make mistakes, as they inevitably will, the first thing that you, people are observing, both within the police and outside of the police, is an attempt to cover it up in the first thing. They go on the defensive. And we, we just look at the, the, G8, the, the G20 summit with the, the, the death of Tomlinson, Mr. Tomlinson, an elderly gentleman who um, was visibly pushed. But the first sort of reaction from the police was almost deny it, even though in, in spite of compelling evidence. Now, when police make mistakes, it would be nice if they themselves did their own self-assessment and came clean right from the onset because you can't fill the people. And when you've got things hovering now, such as you know, the London bombings, clearly people are waking up to that and everybody's still in denial, then it's not just the public that'll wake up to that, it'll be the police. And until that's put right, the, and, and the, the people that can put that right, I believe, are the leadership within the police and leadership within the government. But it's got to come somewhere within leadership, and that's not appearing yet. We're not seeing I... politicians speaking out or police senior managers. No. Can I, can I just step in here, Tony? I, I've, I found as a police officer, um, for example, I made an off-duty arrest one day, um, a punk rocker, one out of 12, and the, his mates tried to get him off of me, so I transferred the loose arm, arm lock to the full body slam and accidentally, completely accidentally, hit his head off a brick wall which was pebble-dashed and sandpapered the top of his head. There was blood everywhere. Um, but I went in and I, I, and I told the sergeant exactly what had happened. I didn't try and cover it up. I didn't make any excuse. I just said, this is what happened. And the sergeant said, fine, we'll get the police surgeon. I looked at it. No problem, because I told the truth. But I've been, saying for a, I've been saying for a great deal of time now that you don't have a problem getting a policeman to take a knife off a six-foot-six drunk. That is not a problem. Yeah. Where we have a problem is to find a police officer who actually has the moral courage to say to his senior officer, back off or I will arrest you for obstructing me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and basically, once an officer reaches the rank of superintendent, my experience has been that generally speaking, they're more worried about their pension than anything else and they will not stick their head above the parapet because they don't want to lose their pension. And I think this is the same for the other thing. And the other point, of course, is that most of our chief constables today are undoubtedly people who joined the police 25 years ago with a university degree and have had accelerated promotion. You do two years on the beat, they make you an inspector. 
You do four years as an inspector, they make you a chief inspector and send you to Brams Hill. You come out of Brams Hill, you end up a superintendent in a very short period of time. Their actual knowledge of on-the-street policing and the problems of on-the-street policing is virtually non-existent because they have spent their entire police career, apart from the first two years, they've spent their entire police career pushing paper. And I think that is a major problem with the police force. They, the senior officers do not understand what street-level policing is all about anymore. That's right, but we still need... It is a question of courage and, 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 and senior decision-makers with that kind of responsibility, well-paid, need to stand up and be counted and not be cowardly. And I think that's a message that has to be given to the police from the public, <laughs> that we want ethical decision-making, and when they get it wrong, hold their hands up. Um, and um, if we can get that, then I think the, the lower ranks will start to respect. But I know, I believe, from my experience, and even on, on, on the, new, the local news, we have in South Yorkshire Police the local news saying that South, morale within the force of South Yorkshire Police is, is at an all-time low. Um, so uh, something has to change, and uh, you know we need the leaders to set an example. And uh, unfortunately, I just don't see that happening within with our politicians and, and our senior ACPO police officers. Yeah, yeah. To Tony and, and, and uh, Brian, may, this may be a result of the common purpose activities. I mean, we've learned that uh, also police um, is involved in common purpose. I mean, do you have any hints there? Or Well, I, I certainly believe it's a factor. Um, I'll just clarify maybe a bit for listeners. We're, we're talking about a, um, an organization based in the United Kingdom called Common Purpose. It is set up. Uh, formally as a charity but when we look at the work of this organization we see that it's not simply a charity it's involved politically and it is definitely uh, promoting an ideology so common purpose is um, very active right through the public sector and, and the police are heavily involved with it and you, you see an organization which is deliberately pushing people through courses and training scenarios where you can actually see that the objective is to change people's beliefs and values. Now, I can tell you that if I, if I go back five or six years ago when I first started warning people of what was happening, a lot of people laughed at me. Um, we've now got to the situation where there is so much evidence as to what this charity is doing. We know, for example, and with the in the UK column, which is a, a volunteer newspaper that I helped produce um, in the last, uh, sorry, the edition before last, we did an expose an exposure on not only common purpose but our own government using applied psychology to change people's behaviour. Now, this is, this is not fiction. It's not a joke. We are showing with the documentary evidence, with the names of the, of the people involved, with the dates of the meetings, we are showing that the British government has set up inside each public body, whether it's the Ministry of Defence or Education or the, the National Health Service, they have set up behavioural change cells and those cells are to use applied psychology to change the way people think and behave. And this, this attack on our minds has actually even been a, um, passed across into the economic field because George Osborne, who's our Chancellor, and of course another millionaire and another man intimately connected with the international bankers, but George Osborne has been pushing very hard over the last year for what's known as behavioural economics. And this is, this is the means by which the government can use applied psychology to change our views on environmental taxes, for example. And yeah, what is the Brian, can I ask, uh, how, Alan, George Osborne, Alan, how Alan. much 
how much is it George Osborne making decisions or is he just carrying out instructions? I mean, we know that George Osborne was a Bilderberger attendee. Um, so how, you know, these guys, like, he's, here's the Chancellor of the Exchequer. How much real power does he have? And, and or if it's not him, then who's behind him pulling the strings, as it were? Well, it, it's, it's my belief, and I'm going to use that expression because I, I couldn't, I can prove this is absolutely true. But if we watch the way British politicians act and, and behave, they are clearly following policy, which is they are being told what to do and what to say. And if you analyse who would be doing this, the only people that, can, that have got the power to, to tell somebody like George Osborne what to do and what to say are the very people controlling the monetary system. So, I, I, for me, it's very clear now. If I look at David Cameron, he is not an intellectual. He may have gone to Eton, he may have gone to a public school costing whatever it is, £80,000 a year to send him there, but he is not an intelligent man. He's not a leader he hasn't got moral fibre. If you look at him at a press conference, he is simply repeating words. And I know that when he was interviewed on the subject of uh, gay rights, um, at one point he clearly forgot his pre-orchestrated uh, responses and very quickly the interviewer made him look a complete idiot. So we've got MPs, as Albert said, they've never held down a proper job they haven't been involved in the military, so they haven't got any experience of life via that route. These are public school boys, and in many cases women, who come into the system, uh, they get elected through safe seats. And uh, then yeah, telling, Bri Brian, with respect, uh, my question was, um, you know, did, did George Osborne, having attended the, a Bilderberger meeting, was he told what to do? Was he ordered to bring in this austerity fascism that we've got in our country? Well, I'd, for me, the Bilderberger conferences are absolutely one route by which people are controlled. If, if, I, if I give listeners the example of Margaret Thatcher, now many people think that Margaret Thatcher was an extremely tough um, prime minister for Britain, but the facts are the moment she expressed at a Bilderberger meeting that she was not wholly committed to the European Union supranational project, the next minute her own party turned against her. Well, actually, they were orchestrated to turn against her, and Margaret Thatcher was kicked out of office. So we, we've seen time and time again that, that people have gone to Bilderberger meetings They've obviously gone there to be assessed, and if they're approved, their careers take off, and if they're not appro approved, their careers drift off into the sideline. So, yes, I would agree, the Bilderbergers are an absolutely key organisation in mm. this new world government. And, of course, seen. these people are very, have to be very corrupt, and they have to have things uh, on them that they can be blackmailed with, perhaps, and... Uh, you know, well, on, I mean, on, are these people criminals, Albert? Should they be arrested, handcuffed, arrested? Oh, I, I, without a question or shadow of a doubt, yes, they should. Um, but we, we come back to the question, don't we, of whether or not you can find a policeman with the moral courage to actually do that, uh, because it would mean going against government. I mean, I know that um, when I when I reported the treason and I had a uh, and then I reported an officer for misprison of treason for refusing to deal with it. Uh, within two weeks, I had a chief inspector, Howard, from the complaints department of Thames Valley Police in my living room, telling me, in fact, that they've cleared the man uh, because um, th if if they got a conviction on uh, against anybody who worked with Edward Heath for, for treason, which they probably could on the information that I had supplied, they would then have to go out and arrest every government minister for the last 35 years and charge them with treason, and that they were not prepared to do. 
And I did point out to him that, A, they're not allowed to make the decision on that basis. They, they are there to uphold the law and purely to uphold the law, irrespective. And uh, by, by taking the stance that he had taken that he was in breach of his, his oath of attestation and was therefore a liar. He didn't like that very much. But he, I, I said to him, I said, well, I wish to God I still had a warrant card. And he said, why? And I said, well, Douglas Heard would currently be sat in a cell waiting for me to decide if I'd drunk enough tea and eaten enough sticky buns to go and interview him. And he said to me, well, you'd be in trouble then, wouldn't you? And I said, why? He said, well, you wouldn't be obeying the orders of your senior officers. And I said, yeah, but why would I be in trouble? He said, well, I've just told you, you wouldn't be obeying the orders of your senior officers. And I mm. said to him, no, you missed the point. Any senior officer who ordered me to do that would find himself in the cell next to Douglas Heard, charged with obstructing an officer in the execution of his duty to detect offences. And I would go on arresting senior officers till I was the highest ranking bloody policeman in the country. And there is nothing you can do about it because that is what the law says I can do. Now, well, I have uh, Albert, Albert, uh, just keep uh, this uh, thought in mind. We are going for a quick break and we'll be right back after this. Uh, just, okay. Uh, stay on, please. IC Radio Network and UWS strongly promote the use of grassroots patriot music. Please drop us a line and we'll play your music. Look from loose to 